Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club this evening. Uh, I'm very glad to see such a good crowd here for an event that at one point we weren't entirely sure was going to go ahead. Um, some of you will have seen some of the discussions that we were having earlier on. We have had uh, negotiations with the authorities, with the NCPO, um, about uh, tonight's subject, uh, and it was a longish discussion, about an hour and a half. They had their concerns uh, that somehow there might be trouble here. I assured them that we've, we're a very orderly crowd and we've never had any real trouble here except when people didn't get the drink they wanted. Um, I, we also said to them, and I'll stick to this, that this is an important subject that we think should be aired and can be aired in a constructive way in the club. It's something we have said all along and not just to this government, to previous governments as well. We pride ourselves on being a forum for debate of all sorts of issues. And we want, you know, every opinion is, is valid here. Every opinion can be heard. Um, and we believe that is constructive and helpful for the country. And we think that can continue even under the constraints uh, of military rule. Um, and I will give credit to... Uh, to Colonel Burin, who we spoke from the NCPO, he accepted that point despite his concerns uh, and allowed the event to go ahead. We're very pleased that that was possible. Um, I did assure him the way that we handle these events is it's a, we don't screen people who come in. It, we're open to outsiders as well, and anybody is uh, free to come and ask a question. Uh, what we don't have at the club is we don't allow that microphone there, which is where you can ask questions from, to be uh, halt is a place for people to make statements, and they're quite comfortable with that. Um, so enjoy tonight's discussion on this really important uh, topic, uh, and feel free once our three panelists have finished speaking um, to line up to ask questions from the microphone. Um, nobody should feel at all constrained. I will tell you there are a few officers from the NCPO here sitting quietly at the back, but they're just here uh, to reassure themselves that we're as well behaved as I said we were, um, and that's all. You don't need to worry about that. Before I get on to tonight's uh, discussion, I'd just like to remind you that we're having our end of year party on Friday. Um, and uh, it's great company, good jazz band, uh, very good value for a very wide range of food. Please do come. If you want to come, please could you uh, put your names down um, in the office at the back. Yeah, there will be a limit to the number of people we can accommodate and it's beginning to fill up. So if you're interested in coming, it's worth going to put your name down now. That's on Friday. Um, the topic of academic freedom, in many ways this is a twin to the topic of freedom of speech in general, which has been an issue ever since the military took over last year. Um, but arguably academic freedom, um, the freedom to discuss all issues relating to Thailand, has suffered from constraints in Thailand, in any case even before the coup last year. It's not unique, it's not new, but it's become more acute um, since the military takeover. We've seen um, discussions shut down, we've seen students being summoned for expressing their opinions and academics as well being summoned and being lectured and being warned and threatened. Um, and it's more than that, you know, in many universities now there are military officers and military intelligence, plainclothes people operating, creating a, a, a rather more intimidating environment. And so we're very pleased to have um, three distinguished and outspoken academics on the panel today. Um, to talk about their experience of academic freedom, uh, how they deal with it, and perhaps some of their views in the longer term on what should be done to expand academic freedom and the concept of freedom of thought in Thailand. Um, right next to me here is uh, Pongkwan uh, Sawat Deepak D. Um, she's a former journalist at Voice TV and is now a lecturer at Tamasat University. Next to her is uh, Eka Chai, uh, China, um, Chainuvat, and he's the Deputy Dean of Law at Siam University, um, another person who's been outspoken about issues of academic freedom since the coup. Uh, and then on his right, uh, Dr. Titipong, um, Titipong uh, Pakdiwanit, who's um, associated with the study of globalization at the University of Warwick, um, where he's a visiting fellow, uh, but is actually based in Ubon Ratchatani, which is, of course, an area uh, where there was a lot of support for the ousted government and for the red shirt movement and where I think the experience of military rule is probably a little different from what uh, we've experienced here in Bangkok. Um, Dr. Titipon, perhaps we could start with you because I think you've got a little bit of video material you want to show us. Yeah. Um. <coughs> okay. 
Good, e good evening, everyone, and thank you for FCCC for organizing such an important event like this. And thank you, everyone, for coming today so that we can perhaps constructively discuss about the freedom of expression and acad academic freedom in Thailand. Um, why is it important to talk about these issues? Because it actually affects my teaching and the ability to learn of students in many ways that we have to openly discuss. And this is perhaps um, it's the issue that uh, I don't think the military seem to understand f uh, the importance of academic freedom. And in my presentation, I will have I'm not going to go through all of this, but then this is the outline that I'm going to go through some quickly. Like the first one is the current state of freedom within Thailand and the current state of academic freedoms and national security or a concern to stabilize power structures and the Thai culture and Thainess. Why is it important and to discuss and how can democracy act to assist Thailand in mitigating the problem of corruption? And is it really a question of democracy versus Thai-style democracy? Do we have Thai-style democracy? This is a, this remain a question whether it is the real thing to talk about. And the importance of economic freedom and the rights for the future of Thai democracy. Before I start, actually, I want to show you a bit of the, the video from my student. And I will explain this uh, video. Is, is it in Thai? And. เยาวชนคนนึงนะครับไม่ให้อ่าดําเนินกิจกรรมการเมืองหรือว่าไม่ให้ทํากิจกรรมอะไรต่างๆที่เกี่ยวข้องกันซึ่งมันเป็นความอ
but we think we think we cannot suspend our teaching because we want the reform process to go through, and this is part of the area of our teaching and my work. And this is the situation. But I will go through this quickly and uh, state of freedom within Thailand. If some may have seen this, and currently in 2015, from Freedom um, Freedom House, and the situation is that status is not free, and freedom rating is 5.7, and the best is one, and the worst is seven, and civil liberty five. Again, the best is one and the worst is seven. And political rights, we are six. And the worst is seven. And when we talk about the role of the military, the problem that we have here is the definition of national security. Because how does it define? It, has not, it hasn't been clearly defined that causes us a problem in terms of teaching. Because when we talk about the definition of um, national security, to me, it would be something that would be threatened to the government or the security of the country, like kind of terrorist, all kind of thing. But the, net, the term national security is, depends on the interpretation or how it is actually defined by the military that make it difficult for our teaching on the university campus. And because like when we were going to organize the human rights event last year on the 10th of December 2014, that was the first one that we got support from the European Union. And to me, I didn't consider as a kind of a threat to national security because the government also want to put forward a reform process. So I think it is important for universities to play a role by putting out this kind of uh, space for discussion, raising the awareness on human rights and this kind of thing, which is actually part of the drafting of the new constitution. But it's w the event was considered to be kind of sensitive issues. So this is a kind of why I said it's it's not clear because when we ask for what does it mean from the military then we never get the answer what is what what do they classify as a kind of national security issues. And when we were first invited, that was my first invitation in the military base. And but it's it's good because the conversation was quite kind of it's not a kind of that threatening, but in the way I still question, why do we have to explain this? Because we are working on the area of human rights. So it shouldn't be the issue that we have to explain to the authority why we are doing it when the country is going through the reform process. And we have to explain about the situation of our faculties as well because how we have been perceived after the coup because the military perceived the faculty of political science as a kind of threat to the, um, the authority because the way they, s they see us is like a kind of because we are dealing with political issues. But then this is what I have to explain to them recently that it is the nature of, of our area of teachings and studies. And students are working in this before, in this area, before the military coup in May 2014. And I have done all kinds of things before the coup. So my um, activities or what I'm doing is not because of the coup. So I have to explain to them that I'm not doing this to against the authority, but this is the work that I have done. So this is kind of the thing that makes it difficult for university lecturers, especially in my area. And the problem is that if you go to Ubon Rajatani, and you can feel it's normal, and when you talk to people in, in my university, most people would say that it's fine, we don't have a problem with freedom of expression but because they are not teaching politics. But why those who are teaching politics or political science should be a target for this? Because if we talk about asking for permissions from the military for organizing event, that's what we have to do. But if you go to faculty of science, they are free to organize everything. But then we still want to produce students who are aware of human rights and democracy. 
So this is a thing that I think is, is a problem when people don't, th don't see it is a problem. It's a big problem for Thailand as well to consider this. And this is the event that I mentioned when we organized this in last year, 2014. Actually, the theme was um, on the human trafficking, which was actually good for the government because the government got a review from, from the State Department. So what we were doing, we had to explain to the NCPO why it's good to, for the NCPO, which I don't think it should be the case that we have to explain. This should be understood by common sense that, you know, by default, what we are doing is just to, to support the process of reform in Thailand. And just a day after the event, we have a visit. And this is a kind of intimidation that I think we, we everyone kind of feel, most people would feel on campus. Because to me, I don't think it is normal to have literally walking on the university campus or driving around in a community truck. And it's, I, I feel like I was in, during the war, you know, like have, every day you see a community truck like, driving around the university campus. And right off campus, we have a military checkpoint as well. And on most events that we organize, we have to ask for permission. And so I have made quite a number of visits to the military base to explain why, why we are doing what we are doing. And this, is, this just happened recently, and we had a visit of the military at the, the faculty as well. And the question is that, how can we deal with this when the definition of national security is not clear? and when it is actually defined by the authority, the NCPO. And it's, it still remains unclear because we never get any kind of official uh, letter or clarification about the term national security. And when we are told that we have to ask for permission for organizing everything, and we actually, we made a, we organized an event once without asking for permission, for permission, which I didn't think that I would have to ask for permission when, I, when we had a meeting with a diplomat from the U.S. Embassy. And then that was um, the issue that the military said that I should have asked for permission first because it's considered to be a threat to national security. This kind of issue is very sensitive. And why is it sensitive? I will give you, why shouldn't why sh should it not be considered as a kind of sensitive issue? Because I will give you the example and what we have done with the American study program. And just again, I just want to summarize a bit of this, the, the nat national security. Because the problem with the interpretation is also interpreted by the military. And the mis misunderstanding often results because the term is used rather loosely. Because when they said national security, like I said, it's, it has never been clear. And why should it be clear? Because it would give a better guideline for us to work under these kind of circumstances. This is a kind of official letter that we received in November 2014. This is actually, is is not uncommon because under the civilian government we also have this kind of letter as well asking university to report what they have done to support the policies of the government. But the reason that I show you this because like number two is about collaboration with international communities or international organizations to help Thailand to improve you know support and collaboration with um, outside or like countries, other countries. And once I read this letter that we received, formally received, and I think that we should also work with the European Union, with the, the US embassies, or with other embassies, like us, to actually to help students and also help to support collaborations as well, or working with the UN. Then this is my common sense when I see this letter. But then it's contradict with the perception of the NCPO. Because like I said, that all kind of activity dealing with international committees, I have to ask for permission. 
So this is a question with what kind of national security is, that is actually mean. And this is another event that we organized just recently on Human Rights Day this year. It was supported by the European Union and the United Nations. And the theme was focusing on LGBT rights and natural death, the right to die with dignity. And again, these issues, I, I don't think it is a kind of threatening to the national security. And I don't think it is a kind of sensitive issues as well. But in this event, we also have to ask for permission. So this is kind of make it more difficult to make progress when we want to talk about the promotion of human rights in Thailand. And this is a term recently that we have. But actually this event, we got a compliment from the military because we focus on LGBT and uh, right to die and we didn't criticize the NCBO. So we got a little note saying that, thank you for organizing such a constructive event, not criticizing or uh, focusing on politically sensitive issues. And this is the other issue that we have to, that why I think it's, it is important to have more freedom because uh, we have American study program which was firstly supported by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Thailand. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs has its own, uh, what they call US Watch, to follow the policy of the United States. And the project was actually working on to support the US-Thai relations. And we had this before the military coup. And we had all kinds of events. And with the limited budget that we have, because we are a university outside Bangkok, so we don't have abundance of resources. So by collaborating with, you know, embassies and this kind of thing, I think it's good for my students because, you know, we don't have to pay, and then, but we get resources to support the study of my students and support the progress of human rights as well. And this year we have a meeting with the local LGBT group called Fasi uh, Lung or Rainbow Sky Group and to talk with the human rights representative from the US Embassy and to discuss how we can work together to support LGBT groups to work on HIV. And we got a visit from the military and then we had to explain to them why we were organizing this. And to me, again, this kind of issue of LGBT is not a kind of sensitive issue. And it, there's nothing to do with politics. But this kind of thing is always, when we are dealing with um, international communities or the embassies or international organizations, the military get kind of rather concerned about what we are doing and question our intention. That I think is, is a problem that we have to address. And we have like representative from the embassy talking about why Siri. And this again, I have to explain why we organize this. But to me, it's important to open up opportunity for students outside Bangkok, rather than letting the opportunity available for just students in Bangkok. So by having embassy going there to motivate students to apply for this thing, because it's available for students and young people across Southeast Asia, so why shouldn't we do this by encouraging our students to take this kind of opportunity? And again, this kind of issues is still not easy to, to work outside Bangkok. And we have students, this is a picture. And another issue is about the, when we had working through American study program, we organized the kind of anti-corruption uh, seminar. And to me again, it's, it's a good opportunity because we didn't have to pay for speakers from America and the embassy has this resource for us, so it's good. And again, I think it's also support the main mission of this government because the Prime Minister made it very clear that and um, fighting against corruption is a top priority of this government. So I didn't think that by organizing this thing would be considered as a kind of sensitive issues but then we were closely monitor and, and this kind of the same thing happened again and again. And this is, I feel that we don't actually have a freedom to, 
to work in the area that we are working on, and it limits the opportunity for students and limits the ability to think and to Skype thing. I just go th quickly through the tightness, but then about <laughs> I will. And the other problem is that about the perception of Thai people today, many people who are not supporting a kind of freedom or who were part of the PDRC still have a kind of this kind of mentality by seeing um, this kind of activity talking about politics or political reform as a kind of those who are trying to create uh, make trouble for the government. Because when we organize this, um, it's called um, a seminar on reform, and this is before the um, the, the previous constitu constitution w was finished, and we organize this. From my opinion, I think it's good to open up more space for people to participate and have more voices and speaking out, because the government couldn't actually include everyone. So to me, it's my role, it's the role of the university to pr provide this kind of spaces or platform for people to engage and express on what they want. And, but this event was kind of perceived as a cup troublemaker. And this is one person shares from my Facebook when I try to actually put this picture out. Like in Thai, is, the translation is that what, what's the point of organizing this event? The connotations of this saying is that why are you doing this when the government is already working on a reform process, having different platform already? Like I said to me, inclusiveness cannot just happen by events that are organized by the government authority. Academics um, on different campus, university should be able to organize this kind of thing as well. And which is another thing that I would argue that is would actually benefit the government rather than um, making trouble for the government. And the promotion of democracy and anti-corruption, I will just go through this quickly. Because when we work on democracy, my, my colleague were called in a few weeks after the military coup, and they were informed to stop working on democracy and human rights. And they were kindly informed, tried to leave it in the hands of the authority. But I think if we talk about democracy and the promotion of human rights, sorry, it cannot be suspended. It should be a kind of continuing process. And all actors should be able to involve and engage. And because when we talk about anti-corruption or fighting against corruption, making things more transparent is very important. And if you see the side here, I'll just give you an example then. It doesn't give you much information about public spending. So this is why I think it is important to work on these issues. And when we work on democracy and transparency, we, we have been working with different communities by, um, like um, a few years ago, we had a project with USA and AID and trying to um, work with people to understand the public spending. So by understanding public spending, it's, I think it would help people to be able to scrutinize the spending of the government or local government and to help with the corruption issues. And so it is important for us to be able to have a kind of freedom to work. And this is just to give you this picture. I will go through this quickly. and. When we talk about democracy, if you see this picture, I, the reason that I use this picture, I want to remind people that everyone has the ability to think. Because if you stay in Thailand, you might have heard a kind of argument that people in villages or rural part of the country cannot think and because they are not well educated. And this picture, I, I took this la took a picture of this lady when I was working on a project when we gave out this kind of handout. It's, it's sure that they are not that ignorant. They also try to learn what we are actually engaging with them. So it's, it's very important to bear in mind that everyone should be included into the process. I'm, 
I don't believe in that kind of uniqueness of being Thai or Thai style democracy because when we talk about de democracy, and I don't think democracy is a kind of Western innovation as well because basically when we talk about participation and equality, it is what everyone wants. It is not just what Westerners want, because when I talk to people here, yeah, everyone wants this, so we want the same thing. So why do we have to um, alienate ourselves from the idea of having have equal rights? And this is a picture again that I took from my few research with people. I just go through this quickly. I just want to finish my presentation with the quote that um, I quite like this because we are under the situation that is not quite free to speak up or work in different areas. So it's from Farid. And what he says that a government must be able to control the government. Then it must be able to control itself. Uh, order plus liberty. The two forces will, in, in the long run, produce legitimate government, government, prosperity, and liberal democracy. So I think um, what the government should consider is to ensure that we have more freedom to, to work on campus, because by putting a more uh, suppression, it's a way to actually um, reduce the legitimacy of, legitimacy of the government. Thank you very much, uh, Ajahn Titipon. <laughs> I'd like to move on to uh, Ajahn Ekachai, um, whom I saw you quoted last year as saying you wanted to leave Thailand, but you're still here. So <laughs> presumably you've managed to make it work for you. Please. Thank you, sir. Uh, the Jonathan Head, the moderator for today. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to thank uh, Colonel Bulin Thong Papai uh, for understanding uh, FCCT and trying to um, living together and, and at least uh, having a chance for me to be here. Uh, this is my, my highest honor to be here to be as a speaker for today's event. Uh, this is my first time uh, with uh, Dr. Titipon. We saw each other on Facebook many times because uh, I saw him on uh, many pictures with Dr. Shanbit and we just have this uh, very sad news of the passing of Dr. Benedict Anderson recently. Also uh, the left side of me is uh, I, I call her many times that she is the smart and the, the beauty of the academic, of the political side. <laughs> the last time we saw each other was the, uh, the release of this uh, group of people who wants to travel to Hua Hin and didn't make it. And we also have a substitute speaker in case that I cannot speak. Uh, Jan Akarapong Kamkun is here. Also, I noticed, uh, if I correct, I saw a very brave uh, lady, uh, Dr. Patapjit Nilapajit, Dr. Patapjit, please uh, stand up, please. Actually, I know her years ago. I have been teaching at Siam University for, uh, this is my 10 year now, and I know her from my, uh, my, my wife, uh, my wife's brother, who's married to a friend of Dr. Patapjit, she has, uh, she had given, she gave a lecture in my public international law course once. Uh, that time was in Ramadan period, and uh, it was the 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 incident of uh, the killing of innocent people in the south in the name of uh, of of religion. And I thank Dr. Patapjit to be a guest speaker there. Also, recently she's, she's, she should be here more than me because she's uh, a lot braver than me. Uh, she uh, encountered many, many obstacles straightforward. Uh, she and Dr. Kotom also have many conversations with the security personnel 
And we have a joke now today that if we have this academic gathering or academic seminar in, in the past, we, we will be worried that there will be no uh, or few attendants uh, attending the seminar. Now we have many security officers, we have policemen, we have uh, the military who's taking so many pictures of us and we, we thank them for at least being a part of attendance and they're quite they, they, they're quite very polite. They will not speak or chat or do anything. They're just playing their mobile phone with the backpack in, 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 in their bag. And I know that uh, they are them. And they know that uh, I am what I am. Uh, to answer <laughs> Mr. Jonathan's question, yes, indeed, uh, before the coup, I was thinking of uh, leaving this country because of this uh, political situation. Um, Mr. Jonathan was the, the last person who uh, interviewed Jadron uh, and also the event was here. Uh, Mr. Jonathan was the person who interviewed uh, Kun Sirovit, Seri Tiwat. That was a very, a very brave uh, thing that you did. Um, let me go to, to the point why I'm here today, academic freedom. I am from a private university. In this country, we have public and pri private university. Chan uh, Bongkwan is from a public university who just recently transformed into a, what I call a part public, part private university. She will explain later. But the fact for a private university in Thailand is that we have a definite number of, uh, of the owner of your university. So I have my, some of you may call a, a president, uh, some of you may call the rector. Uh, he is the, the big boss of, of my institution. Uh, his name is Dr. Pon Chai Mongkonwanit. He is a graduate from uh, University of um, Madison, Wisconsin, you know, the Badger. I, I uh, am an alum of uh, uh, University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. Uh, this year we lost to I Ohio State U. I'm, I'm quite sad to, say, to see that, but <laughs> it's, it's a fact. We have some Buckeye State fan in the back. Um, I, I just gave an interview to Bangkok Post in the case that they uh, canceled the event today. And my interview is still the same. Freedom, academic freedom is not absolute. Uh, the basic freedoms can be limited, but under the democratic system, that uh, limitation of the freedom and rights must be done through the parliamentary system, which is the uh, representative of the people. You know, the people, all the people, being one person, one vote, uh, choose their representative, and being a legislator and restrict the rights of freedom in a democratic society. Um, we have this constitutional guarantee of freedom uh, we call academic freedom. Frankly speaking, I, I don't believe in that. You know, you have 20 constitution in, in my lovely country. Uh, the, the only country that, that I'm a, a citizen here. We have 20 constitution. We, we see many things. I can't elaborate beyond this point. But I just don't believe in what the constitution guarantees. Right now, the supreme law is the law that they think it is. You know, uh, and, and that's my statement for today. Uh, for my position, I'm under the contract, just, uh, just uh, we call that an open-end contract of being a lecturer. Uh, I'm retired at 60. I, my minimum guarantee is the same as the uh, labor law contract. Jan Akrapong just past these difficulties of renewing his contract. He just got renewed his contract last week. Uh, 
you can speak on behalf of me. <laughs> but uh, my contract is under the direct uh, direct supervision or direct um, observation from the university. The blessing for me is that my president, when we have this political crisis during the amnesty bill, am amnesty bill in December of 2055-56, I was very impressed by him, uh, the president, and I'm still today impressed by him today. We have this president uh, university meeting, and everyone, every university has a stand on this amnesty bill. Amnesty uh, Bill. That bill was supposed to be for the former Prime Minister. Uh, my president uh, summoned me to his office and he said, Ekashai, I just returned from Sweden and uh, president of a uh, Swedish university, uh, one university in Sweden, asked me curiously of why the president of the university must have any political stance. He said the, the job of the president is not to have any stand. My job, his job, is to provide every way possible for all the lecturers outside and inside the university to have an equal chance of speaking uh, publicly at the university. And that was uh, the exact quotation. He thinks that uh, he sh should not have any political stand on an NSD bill. Um, uh, I have this rivalry with uh, a doctor, one doctor, many, many knows him, uh, Dr. J. Uh, my president said to me, it's fine, you know, you have two different opinions. Uh, one side is uh, for the red shirt, another side is for you know whatever color he he think he is, but uh, the job for the university is to let both of you have the equal opportunity and to not oppose in any way possible for that uh, freedom of speech, and was that what that was the statement of my president, but I I don't want to go over time, but. I'm self-censorship a lot. Like today, we have quite a few topics that we cannot ever discuss. Uh, part of being a foreign journalist, you can print something, but uh, Thai journalist, that things you cannot print. And myself, I know what the the line that I would not ever cross. If I cross that line, the next day I'm out of job. You have to, you have to spend some time here in Thailand to understand where exactly that line is. Even, I think it's, it's the, the culture of each university that as a lecturer, as a, an academic, you have to know what what you say or what you cannot say. But one thing for sure, I just gave interview to Bangkok Post, I said, what you cannot say is you, you cannot incite or invoke people to go to violence or you cannot say a hate speech or discriminatory or racist speech. What I say publicly must be my responsibility. It's, it's with me, it's my boss when I say it, um, and I have to be responsible for what I say. Uh, let me show you something. Uh, I, I used to show this before. Uh, this is the Matichon newspaper of... Um, I'm getting a little drunk of the draft, <laughs> Heineken beer. Uh, the bartender said I would get the next one for free. <laughs> the first one I pay. Uh, April 23rd, this was the first time I was on the front page of uh, any newspaper. The first time, and the, 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 the paper, you, you can uh, distribute, that's, that's uh, 
there's no way that uh, we get in trouble uh, reading uh, this this paper. Just that we have different attitude. On that day, uh, the military personnel driving a Humvee with a po uh, with uh, four military officer arriving at my home exactly five seconds after I I arrive at home. Uh, my I have three kids. My uh, middle and the youngest one is uh, six and three years old. When they saw Humvee, they are afraid. They uh, didn't want to go outside. They didn't want to see me. The first, the first sentence I spoke to this uh, fine, uh, noble military officer, I said, Sir, when you remove your uniform, you are just as human being as me. You, you go home, you take care of your kids, you pick up your dog's poop, you clean the dish. <laughs> I said exactly like this. Uh, many people hear from me uh, exactly something like this from me uh, in other events, but I said like this. You removed your uniform. You're just as human being. You are just as high as me. We just talk, talk nicely. What do you want from me, sir? And you know, you know what the response is? Uh, he gently, this is true, he gently said, Ajahn, Please go to this uh, reconciliation meeting. That day, they distributed 140 letters by hand. Imagine that by hand, because their boss said, you have to deliver by hand to 140 uh, academics, uh, Ubon, Pisnulo, anywhere, Chiang Mai, and make sure that as many people uh, attend the reconciliation meeting that the, the military set up. It's called the Reconciliation uh, Commission. The, the whole purpose of that, of that incident was just to deliver this invitation letter. But I was afraid. My two children were afraid. Uh, also, the military was suspicious of me being uh, hostile or being negative. But at the end, I said, if you just want to invite me, first question, how many days you want me? How many days you want me to spend at your conference? He said, no, sir, please, please understand, you will return home safely. The next day, sir, he, he, he asked me, sir, do you, want, do you want us to pick you up and drop you off at your home? Please tell me the exact time uh, we will be there. I said, no, 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 I can take care of myself. I can go to the conference by myself. My point is that we have this distrust. We have this distrust between, no, not, not between, but among Thai people. Why can't we all just think that, um, pardon me excluding you as a foreigner, but why can't Thai all just think that we have to be here, we have to live here, and this problem or whatever problem they think they have, would not go along or would not solve if we still think differently. If the military still think that they are different from the people, and if the people still think they are different from the military, that won't go anywhere. So I just end my, um, my talk here and I uh, throw back and uh, this uh, gentleman saw me that I removed my Heineken. Oh no, I removed my alcoholic drink outside the uh, conference table to make sure that I don't have any problem with the alcoholic act <laughs> anymore. <laughs> so thank you for your attention and please, uh, Ms. Uh, thank you, Ajahn. Thank you. Well, we're, we're very glad you're still here, Ajahn Ekachai. Ajahn Pongkwan, perhaps um, <laughs> you could follow on with your own perspective of uh, working as an academic under military rule. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first of all, thanks um, the FCCT for holding this. And also, thank you the NCPO to actually allow this to happen because it would be really weird if I can't really talk about something relevant to my career, academic freedom, right? Um, so I would like to start like this. The, the line that we actually trying to clarify in the word academic freedom is really blur. 
we don't know what actually academic freedom is in Thailand right now. Um, Sometimes we understand academic freedom acts as an extension of the freedom of expression. So we usually talk about the academic freedom because when we are under the military government, we are under you know the coup d'état or whatsoever regime that we could not express our views very clearly. We tend to ask the academ academic scholars to actually have more rooms to say that, and we will call that academic freedom because we believe that well, probably academics should have more rooms than other people than citizens to speak up, which is actually not true because academic freedom is not only, it's not only um, freedom about, it's not only about the freedom of expression, it's about other rights, freedom to do the research, freedom to teach as well. And also on a second point, if we want to argue about the freedom of expression, we should not exclude citizens. We should not talk only academic freedom without the freedom of expression. And we should not give privilege to only academics, academia to express their views, but also other people, citizens in this country as well. So let me start like this. Um, I will actually divide my talks into basically three parts. The first part, I would actually trying to understand the word academic freedom, understanding of academic freedom in Thailand. Secondly, I would try to actually explore how other countries view academic freedom. And lastly, I would actually try to uh, analyze whether we actually have academic freedom, whether that we would want to compare to the United States or continental Europe, right? And I would probably bring out some of my personal experiences. I have just started teaching for a year, but I have actually, you know, saw, see, I have seen some of of intervention by the police and military, which I think that is not a very good sign for well, um, either academic freedom or freedom of expression. And let's start with the first part. Uh, actually, the concept of academic freedom is very uh, alien to Thailand, very new. It just well, it was introduced in 19, just late 1960s with Dr. Sulak. Um, so actually we were not really familiar with the idea of academic freedom to begin with uh, and because during that time we had to actually really we had to fight for democracy and stuff like that we were under the military government as well as we are today um, so mostly academic freedom was interpreted as freedom of expression have rooms for academia have rooms for someone to actually speak up um, asking for rights asking for freedom to actually criticize the regime. So basically, that's why we never have a real discussion about real academic freedom, but rather the understanding of academic freedom as the freedom of expression. Um, and also, I think even though the idea was introduced in, 19, in the late 1960s, it is still not clear what we are seeking today. Because if we're talking about academic freedom, itself it's not only the right to talk in public or the right to actually you know speak up in anything you want to speak but also the right to do research on everything you wish to do uh, you should not be stopped by the funding organization in the country which happened mostly to be the state organization in Thailand uh, you should not be stopped should not be intervened by big businesses politicians to actually stop you from doing from seeking for the truth in this country right so in that case I think academic freedom is wider than freedom of expression that we are trying to say today. And I'm actually trying to see whether actually other types of, you know, other categories of uh, academic freedom, do we really have that in Thailand right now, right? Um, so I think the, the understanding of academic freedom in Thailand, again, does not go beyond freedom of expression. When we, are, when we are looking at other places, other countries in the world, although they have different definitions of um, freedom or academic freedom, they have it in the same way. So it's not, it covers, you know, works of academia, not only work to speak up for audience, not to not only the right or freedom to disseminate our academic work for public, but also how we can teach in the class as well. And if you're looking at the news today, having the prime minister talking that, well, they're going to send someone to the classroom preventing us from say something bad about the government, that you could probably see the, decrease, the, the decreasing degree of academic freedom in Thailand already. So let's start here. 
uh, how other countries view academic freedom. And if you're actually familiar with that academic freedom in that country, so feel free to correct me at the end of um, my talk as well, because I would also like to learn from you as much as I can share my experience with you. So in the United States, as I understand, um, under the statement of principles on academic freedom and tenure, um, Teachers are entitled to freedom in the classroom to in discussing their subject with the limitations of academic freedom because of religious and other aims. So basically, you can talk about anything, just not crossing the line. So basically, you have the right amount of academic freedom. But actually, after I figure out um, the information about other countries, the United States is probably not a good example for academic freedom um, comparing to other countries in Europe. Because in Europe, Germany, for example, allows you to actually try to persuade students to believe in the um, philosophy that you believe in, political stance that you believe in, with the exception that you cannot state your own political stance or your own belief in the classroom, but you can probably introduce them evidences, arguments in the classroom in order to try to persuade them to believe what you're believing. So that's the case for uh, Germany. Continental Europe believe in freedom to research, freedom to dissemination, freedom to teach, autonomy of academic institutions. That's like what Ajahn Ekashai actually said earlier, uh, that the Sw one of the Swedish institutions actually asked um, the president of the Thai University, why does the head of our university have to stand, have to have political stance? Because internationally, we should not allow any power to interfere into our academic institutions because first, campus universities or research institutes should be the place where people can produce work achieve a better society to make people understand more about society, science, whether of whatever it is. We should not have other power who could probably sway the country to one or another uh, side to actually intervene and say, well, this is what you have to do, this is what you cannot do. So um, the universities should have autonomy to prevent authorities from actually coming into university and sitting in into classes. There, there was also a case in Japan, I have actually talked to my friends who graduated from a Japanese university that it was a legal case where actually where a police officer went into the university non-uniform, didn't wear a uniform, trying to prevent um, students from organizing a a discussion on political topics or something else. Uh, and, the, and the students actually figured out that that guy uh, is a police officer, so they actually locked him in in the closed room, right? And they have the right to do that because the university has the authority to actually prevent these interventions from coming in into you know, other forces. This is what we are not seeing in Thailand at all. So. Uh, so I'm not saying that we don't have academic rights. I'm saying that we don't see what other countries are having. Uh, but I mean, like, Thailand claims themselves to be really unique. So we might have a unique understanding of academic freedom. I don't know about that. Oh, so my next point is that do we have the same level of academic freedom under the military governments as well as civilian governments? So uh, two professors have talked to you a lot about um, our universities under this current government, military government after the coup d'etat, how they actually intervene into the university, how they actually trying to stop us from holding organizing events, how they actually force us to asking for permission before holding or hosting any events, right? Um, in fact, we even, out, even without the military regime, we never really have the real academic freedom. Right? If you see, well, freedom to research, freedom to dissemination, freedom to teach autonomy to academic institutions, we never really have that academic freedom, even without the military governments. It's probably getting worse with the military governments. Doesn't mean that we always have that, even we don't have the coup d'etat. Why? Because right now, although the, constitu the current constitution does not really protect academic freedom to begin with, but with other constitutions, which some of them actually state academic freedom into the constitution, there is a verse that say, well, uh, the constitution 
says that we cannot, well, we can express, use our freedom of expression, academic freedom, but not to the level that it would actually um, undermine morality and, you know, like the goodness of the society. So that is a very vague uh, term. So we don't know how they would actually interpret that. Um, even, you know, especially under this kind of circumstance, and again, we don't really have that uh, article in that in, um, constitution anymore, but it is very vague uh, statement that depends on uh, people in power to actually interpret that. So in that case, do we really have academy freedom? I don't think so, because if it depends on someone to, in, uh, to interpret it, we are actually not protected by anything, right? Secondly, uh, because we are on a contract system, so basically we like other employees in the world, labor contract. Uh, when we are in a labor contract, it means that we are in an unequal relationship between employers and employees, right? And although they tried to, you know, set up all these evaluations to standardize, uh, you know, the teaching career in this country, you cannot actually deny that to evaluate social science, not talking about like science work because that's much easier to be evaluated. Uh, talking about social science works, they're harder to be evaluated using all of these, you know, metric. It's more subjective. So which means that if we are in this contract uh, system, although we have produced work, uh, we are not really guaranteed that we will we can renew our contract because it's very subjective. It's it's really up. It depends on people who evaluate us. So in that sense, we have no protection at all. So you cannot really uh, expect academic freedom from us because if we do something that is going against the mentality or the stance of someone who has more power than us, we are very risky of being kicked out of the university. So that is the, the case without the military government in normal situation. The system has set up this way that we actually doesn't, we don't really have protection. We cannot be assured that we can be, we can continue our career as an academic forever. Now, with the military in place, things get worse, right? Because they usually intervene into universities. Well, I myself, I am pretty lucky that uh, in Tamasad University and political science, faculty of political science, uh, we have a tradition of being more open. So I am very lucky to have a good boss who actually tried to protect us uh, to some certain level. So I never got into troubles before because but I, I heard from my boss that uh, the military came to the faculty from time to time to talk with uh, our dean, but he didn't, he didn't really say anything. He didn't point out to anyone in the faculty. So we pretty much have, uh, we are luckier than people in other faculty that, that usually are more sensitive to, to um, political influence or external influence. So, but even with that, I have, actually seen or experienced some of the things that actually should not really happen to academic that will undermine actually academic freedom. So uh, in a lot of public sessions that I'm, I, I plan to, to organize, I need to ask for permission. That would probably be the same experience as everyone has. Uh, and also, like, I, ha I, I plan to hold a seminar on economic performance. So just economic performance, we're not talking about rights, freedom, or anything. That one needed was, um, we had to ask for permission to hold that uh, public session as well. So it actually covered a wide range of, of topics. It's not only about freedom, rights, democracy, but can also go further into economic, economy, economic situation. Um, I went to Ajahn Somsak. Ajahn Somsak is was a lecturer at Tamasad University. He is right now in exile in another country because, uh, so he produced a lot of work that probably would be classified as uh, 
um, under the Article 112. So he actually had to be in exile, and now uh, basically he's kicked out of the university. But with the technical, you know, terms, reasons that our rector actually has given in interviews two days ago. So I would rec actually not comment on that. But um, so because I think lecturers should have some certain degree of protection you know to say things about the country by the fact that the university could not really protect him that actually said something about academic freedom right the de well the rector came up front saying that well because he didn't follow the university regulations that's why the university could not protect him. I don't think that is a good way. Actually, I don't want to criticize. Actually, I, I'm not going to criticize my, my rector at all. Um, he's my employer. Uh, so yeah, but because the next day we launched a statement saying that how can, we, how can we be assured that if we say something that might be a little sensitive, we're not going to get into trouble, right? Um, I got some kind of pressure from reading the statement. Uh, so it didn't, go me, it didn't go to me directly. It went through other professors trying to circulate around, you know, and try to talk to me later on. So the problem happened to be that I should not criticize my own university. You, you should, I should not criticize my own workplace. Uh, I don't know who actually said that, definitely when the leadership, my employers, uh, that I, I can criticize everything else, politics, economics, the governments, whatever I want, uh, with the exception of the university, because that's my workplace and I should not actually criticize it. Um, that is, well, and I take that and I, I'm not going to criticize my university, I'm, go I'm just going to tell other people what I have listened and heard, right? This is what I have heard. Uh, I'm not going to criticize it. Um, so again, uh, I got the same invitation letter, but thankfully they sent it through email. <laughs> they didn't send someone to hand in the letter to me for that reconciliation uh, seminar session, whatever it is. I refused to go because definitely they just sent an email a day earlier. They could not expect a scholar to be that free, I guess. Uh, we are also busy people. And also another uh, seminar that some that they sent police officer to intervene was a discussion on justice, but philosophical discussion. So we were talking about John Rawls and Amartya Sen, and they sent someone in and asked me, what are you going to talk about? And I was like, I'm talking about John Rawls, Amartya Sen. And again, Amartya Sen does not does not have to do anything with Ahmad, the word Ahmad, or the elite in Thailand, it's just a name. I had to say this because um, uh, the, the Faculty of Economics actually organized the talk on the philosophy of Amatya Sen before, Faculty of Economics. Uh, the police officer actually intervened into that, and we thought that because they believe the word Amatya Sen represents something like Ahmad, right? Um, again, I'm not making fun of them, I'm just saying what I heard, right? Uh, <laughs> And I think what is worse is not the physical intervention of them, but more or less psychologically, that we have to impose self-censorship all the time. Thomas Sun University right now has non-uniform military walking inside the, con uh, inside the university all the time. Um, I gave interviews to, I gave interview to um, journalist, news reporter, I got someone, you know, non-uniform police, took photos of me. Nothing had to do with the government at all. It was about something else. How could you be sure that in that case you, you can, you know, have peace in mind that you can talk about anything and not getting into trouble? That is psychologically really threatening to uh, academia inside the university. And again, uh, these are all my um, personal experience that I have actually seen only in one year of my career. And I'm not actually criticizing anything. I'm not saying that you are doing bad job or anything. It's your job. I know the military has a job of keeping an eye on. I'm just going to passing through all of my experience to other people to learn what they have actually done. One last thing that I have, I want to mention before I'm closing my speech or my talk for today is that uh, one of the reasons that people around the world actually believe in freedom, of, sorry, academic freedom, 
is because they believe that even though we have only one side argument from one people or one side of people, they believe that we can have logical arguments or logical discussions from the other side of people as well. So then we have checks and balances. The fact that we the fact that whoever has authorities in this country has to intervene, interrupt, violate the academic freedom. Could it actually mean that they does not have the ability to engage logically in political dialogue and academic dialogue? And I want to end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I don't think we've ever tried locking up any police officers here. I don't think we've got any cupboards big enough for them. We promise we won't do it tonight. No, right. um, listen, the floor is open to questions. The microphone is there. I'd like to prioritize working journalists, uh, if there are any of you who'd like to ask questions first, um, or academics, whichever would like to ask first. Um, before you take the microphone, perhaps I could jump in as moderator to ask a question to all three of you. Um, one obvious role, I would think, for political science academics would be at this time when the, uh, the current government has initiated what it calls a political reform program. It wants to reform the entire political structures of the country. I mean, do you feel in the current situation that academics are being involved in that and that you can play a role in that reform process they talk about? Could I have an answer from all three of you, starting with Ajahn Titipon? Um. I, I personally don't think that everyone is included into the process of the reform because by in, including everyone into the process, they tend to argue that if you want to be part of it, then apply to take one position on, the com on any kind of committee or any uh, structure that has been created by the NCPO. But to me, um, sometimes people don't have all kind of time to take part in that. So being including into the process, it should be more open to everyone. Like, we can be included by working, like I said in, in my example, when, when I worked towards the kind of archive, organizing those kind of seminars, opening public spaces, that is another form of including into the process. But then this kind of thing haven't been considered as a kind of contribution to the reform process. Actually, and the other thing that I want to mention, because Ajahn Pong Kwan made a good point about the ability to do research, because by including as well, being inclusive and in including into the process is that I think we should be able to help people to be included as well. But then the difficult thing for me as a lecturer in Ubalajatani, um, because if you look at the demographic structure and the northeastern part of Thailand, it's a stronghold of the poor Thai. So by implication, the majority of the population in Ubon Lachatani are part of the uh, uh, are supporting the Puerto Thai Party, and they have been classified as a red shirt. And why is it important to mention this point? Because it makes it difficult for me to do a research. Like, you know, when we try to get opinions from people, how do they feel about the government? How, what do they think about the reform process? I cannot freely go into villages because um, a kind of psychological impact that we have, you know, because if you go out and then if you are seen talking to the rich or people in villages, then it would be a kind of all kind of questions or some kind of accusation of supporting the rich. Because I can give you the example I just mentioned to my friend that because once uh, the Rachel I have been dealing with by asking for information, and she owned um, the uh, garage. And after the coach, she told me that her clients who were work who are working in the toy in the military base in Hobon were asked to remove all of the stickers. You know, the toy garage. They have sticker of of the the garage. And then she said, all of her clients who well, military were asked to remove all of the stickers. I said, why? Because I didn't, I didn't get the point, you know, like stickers of, you know, the garage. And she said that her clients were told that 
if they keep the sticker on the car, then by implication, they are supporting the red shirt. So this is a kind of difficulty that we have by you know, trying to include and engage and work with different groups, and it's, it's not that easy. Thank you. Ajahn Ekachai, has anybody asked you to go and contribute to the reform process? Uh, no, sir. <laughs> uh, nobody asked me to go to this, uh, any political, political reform program. My stand is that um, now it's time for the uh, it's time for General Bayut and NCPO and his uh, and his team to to show what he can do. I just mentioned earlier that I I always uh, said this to the media when I give an interview. I don't think that the political problem can be solved by military means. Because people, we, we change our minds all the time. Sometimes I like Kun Ying Lak, sometimes I like General Bayut, and also I don't have any problem at all with the way or the fluence or not fluency of uh, Kun Prayut speaking English. That's not the whole point. Uh, many of the leaders cannot speak a uh, different language. The point is that what he do, or what he does, or what he did, and what he will do. Uh, so my stand is to uh, to wait and see and remain uh, remain mute or silent on this uh, political uh, reform program. So when they they could not succeed because of uh, people who not go with them, I could have a better laugh. Uh, that's, that's all for me. You, you don't think you can contribute at the moment? I can contribute, but I'm quite sure they would just nod their head and say thank you. <laughs> thank you. I jump on Kwan. Um, first of all, nobody has asked me yet. Um, secondly, I'm not sure uh, whether be, be... I Actually, I, it's a dilemma, right? Um, so first, I don't... So first, I don't want to actually contribute because that would actually legitimize the process, which is not legitimate to begin with. But secondly, if we really have to leave with this process after this, it might be a good idea to actually you know, participate. So I'm, I'm lucky that I don't have to decide it because nobody actually have asked me to. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a dilemma because on the other hand, I wouldn't want to legitimize this system. Um, is it a problem of legitimacy, or is it because you don't believe that the reform process that's underway has any real possibility of making meaningful change? I think both. I think both. It's also the problem of legitimacy, because um, we should not actually support something that did not have legitimacy to begin with. It was not legitimate, right? Just take the power and then start the process. Secondly, I, I, I don't think that my opinion will be that useful and helpful for them. I mean, like, I can probably say whatever. If they don't want to hear, then they don't want to hear. But do you have opinions about how you think the, re the political structures of the country should be restructured? Uh, I think it should not be structured by an only small group of people. Okay, thanks. Um, first question, Michael. Um, Michael Mackey, freelance. Um, you're all political scientists, and I'm just wondering how pervasive um, the problems that you've outlined actually are. And I'm thinking of it in two levels. Is it um, confined to just you three? Are you the troublemakers? of the academic world here in Thailand? Or do other academics tell in your um, political science, an Americanism that really sort of throws me, um, it, it, do other people who teach in other political science, as they're called here, faculties, report a similar problem? And then I'm also wondering how are other faculties dealing with it? Because there must be some kind of impact on other faculties as well. For example, you mentioned tax spend. How do, how do economics departments deal with this? And I'm wondering how pervasive it can actually be because 
when you take something like the government's support for Tynus, another concept that was never really defined, I'm wondering, please don't take my photo, I'm not having a particularly good day. Um, uh, I'm also wondering, when you look at the issue of culture, would they be willing to get in and sort of supervise lectures on that level? Is it that pervasive that it gets down to the nitty-gritty of, say, contextual analysis? Thanks. It's a long question, but uh, basically how widespread is the, the, the intimidation and the, the problems you're talking about, and uh, how deep does it go? Um, um, I, I would put it this way, um, like on the surface, it's like nothing happened. But then the monitoring, the way we have been controlled it, go deeper than sometimes we have thought of, like unless, until I actually m had an, a meeting with the military. Like, you know, as, as a lecturer, I just think that I can teach and then, okay, after the coup, we have a limit, kind of ceiling what, of what we can talk. That what I think that what it was. But after a meeting with the military, then I was informed that, um, you know, they said to me that, oh, Ajahn, you know, that we get all kind of information. And we have, like, uh, um, sons, like daughters, studying at your universities and this kind of, uh, source of information that we have. So it's a kind of thing, this kind of thing that is happening kind of lead to a kind of self-censorship because we are not sure what would be considered as a kind of political sensitive issues. Like I mentioned about the terms national security, it also depends on the interpretation of the authority. and. Many people also in my area, also in my faculty, we also experience this. But like I said, and if you talk to people in the, the other faculty, like um, economics, they wouldn't feel this kind of uh, uh, limitation. Because actually, the military says it, to, says it very clear to me that they would actually monitor faculty of political science and law closely because it is likely that students from this faculty would actually become a kind of politically active. And this is what I try to explain to them. Their activities are not a threat to the military. It's just the activities that they have been doing for their studies. And this is a thing that we have to think that uh, when people don't see it as a problem, I think it's, it's quite a big problem for for Thailand when people don't take action to support this kind of freedom. Any comment from uh, the other two? Uh, to answer very short, if you are in faculty of political science and faculty of law, you're quite under heavy eyes of the police and the military. So, and if you're outside but you are become relevant, you're talking too loud or talking to public, then you have a close full eye of the military. Thank you. Ajahn Pongkwan. Um, the faculty of economics just let the, the police officer go into the, the seminar and they were there for like a couple of minutes and then they left because nothing had to do with Ahmad. Um, and <laughs> I think political science um, scholars are under the radar. Um, I mean like uh, uh, keep a close eyes from the officers because we tend to deal more with politics. Doesn't mean that other professors and other faculty that that comments on politics does not get the same kind of warnings and stuff like that. But actually, um, might be unbelievable, but compared to other faculty, I feel like the atmosphere in faculty of political science, at least in Thammasat University, is still better than atmosphere in other faculties in Tamasa. So we don't really get much pressure. Thanks very much. Um, okay. Nick? Hello, I'm Nick Nostitz. Um, I have a question about, uh, basically you mentioned m quite a bit of that already during your uh, speeches. It's about taking the political stance. So, so the fault lines of, let's say, red, yellow, or pro-coup, anti-coup, or pro-amnesty, anti-amnesty have been also going through the um, academia. Now, where many universities have ta taken like quite an open pro-PDRC stand uh, 
from their deans. How how is the situation now within the university? I mean, um, do you do you get pressure from let's say the uh, momentarily winning side, the um, pro PDRC lecturers? It's one part of the question. The second part of the question: Have you seen um, let's say shifts that people? lecturers who have taken a pro-PDRC stand are now shifting into an anti coup stand or are the fault lines more or less the same as they always were? Who's brave enough to take that one on? <laughs> well, well, Mr. Nick, you, you can ask in Thai too. You just speak Thai fluently. Um, of course, I'm being, I'm being portrayed as the, uh, you know, Red Buffalo or Red Shirt Academy. Uh, first, I was very upset. I was very angry because I still haven't received any monetary compensation from the former prime minister. We are the same boat. <laughs> <laughs> um, but currently or until now, you, you have to just to guesstimate when you uh, meet some academics and you're not quite sure of what they think. You have to look first. You have to say, oh, hello, uh, today is a nice day, or oh, bad traffic, oh, this is flat, or oh, something like that. And then you just try to study this or that person. But to be fair, uh, at my institution, uh, all of them are quite civilized. They just don't come to me in person and say, you're just anti institution or you're just, you know, lay back for or anything. And I uh, respect and I uh, thank my colleague for that. Any others? I mean, uh, one question that, as a follow-up to what Nick said might be, can anybody explain why so many of the rectors and senior members of so many well-known universities were so strongly supportive of the PDRC? Um, that was very striking to me during the protests. Uh, let, let, let me answer uh, Mr. Jonathan here uh, this shortly. Go back and look at the last two coups. When you have the last two coups, there are some institutions who are privatized. And that's all I can say now because I might get others into trouble. Uh, the coup of 49, the coup of 57, when they have this National Legislative Assembly, there's a law to privatize the public institution. And that's all I can say. Okay, a little mystery. Did you have anything to follow up with, Nick? Okay. Just, just, uh, anybody, is oh. there, has there been any shift, you know, from, let's say, uh, sim simplifying it from, from yellow to red, or is it the same? You mean from, from the PDRC? To what's an anti coup position, or is there. Um, from my opinion, I think um, the supporter of the PDRC is remain in denial to accept the truth or the fact about the performance of the current government or the what happened in Thailand after the coup. Because they like, if you look at the argument before the coup, like they said, we want to purify the country, we want to reform, we want to remove corruption, but then today we don't talk much about that. And I think to some extent these groups are kind of in denial to accept what happened or what is going on in the country. And this is quite worrying. I think we should be openly talk about this. If we want to reform, because everyone wants to reform, everyone wants to talk about you know, anti-corruption in Thailand to support the government. So if we really want to support the government, then we should make things more transparent in order to help the government to achieve what they actually want to, to do for the country. And that, that is what I think. Thank you. Yeah. Next question, please. I'll try to be quick. Uh, first, I just wanted to mention, uh, I, I've studied in ABAC for quite a while. And uh, officially, ABAC, they go beyond the neutral stance of not interfering with the political opinions of individuals to strongly discouraging anyone from having and expressing their political opinion uh, in any way connected to the university. They, they proclaim that they are completely neutral. 
although if you've been there for not very long, it's plain to see uh, what color they are unofficially. But they do acknowledge that they can't punish students for what they do outside of campus unless they actually break the law. They do acknowledge that. Uh, and a, a question for Ajahn Pongkwan specifically to uh, involving Tamasat. Uh, you mentioned that the concept of academic freedom uh, started to emerge in the 60s. Uh, I, I thought it would have been earlier than that with Dr. Pretty and the idea of freedom in every square inch. Uh, could, could you mention a bit of uh, Dr. Pretty's idea of academic freedom and how that maybe compares to the later ideas from the 60s onwards? Thank you. Um, from what I understand, um, when, when Dr. Preeti introduced the idea of freedom every inch, um, I think it includes usually freedom of expression um, and other freedoms. Um, the idea of academic freedom didn't emerge into that time yet. Um, it was only freedom for students to participate, freedom for students, academia to actually express themselves. Uh, but, but, but the idea, the word itself, academic freedom, didn't come until 1970s. It was just introduced during that time and still was not well understood as well. So. In comparison, I think um, both of them, Ajahn Pridi and, and Ajahn Sulak, uh, who introduced the word academic freedom in, in Thailand, uh, stood for, both of them stood for freedoms. But, and particularly uh, about how other countries understand about academic freedom, like this right that we have just discussed, just un, uh, was just introduced in 1960s. Thank you. The next question, please. Hello, um, it's Siwan from Kaosot English. Uh, first of all, I, w I wonder, like, Thailand has been under the military government so many, many times. So in your opinion, is the current situation under the current military, uh, is that how bad exactly is it compared to the other times uh, in history? And the second question is that, uh, apart from the journalists and academic society who are sitting here, is there any major concern outside the university, like for normal people, uh, about the suppression of uh, academic freedom in Thailand, or is there uh, any systematic effort to against the the suppression, or uh, exactly uh, like I don't know how people outside the university feel, how much they feel related to this issue. It's to any one of you. Uh, I'm a little bit drunk, so <laughs> I, <pass. laughs> I, I I can take this question. Um, when we talk about um, um, I I came to work at my university in 2005, so I experienced um, two military coup d'etat in 2006 and 2014, um, in 2006, when on the, the night of 19th of September, I was asleep, and then my friend called me from England. What happened? How, how, how are you feeling? Is it cool? And I didn't know because I was sleeping. And after that, I didn't feel much of a kind of suppression, which is different. But perhaps it's also a different context as well because I just started working. I just try to imagine myself if I was an kind of experienced political scientist in 2006, what kind of experience would I actually have had? But then in 2014, things are quite different because um, you know, I have been working in the area for almost 10 years. So then I have been working in different areas and I found out that I have been followed in my first meeting when I talked to the military because like I actually mentioned to Bangkok Post that when I introduced my name like Titipon and then they call me my nickname, you know, in Thai, it's, you know, if you are a stranger, you don't tend to know people's nickname. So it's quite kind of scary for me to know, to know that. 
and they said, oh, we have been uh, following you, trying to get information about you, and then, but they try to be friendly, but it's not a kind of friend, friendship that I would want to have, you know, being followed and being monitored. And this is a thing that I think, to some extent, because the military or the CPO are too paranoid about the Faculty of Political Science, as I said, we try to explain that we are not a threat. We are actually working to support the NCPO. Actually, if they look at the way we work, like have promoting democracy, this is what they want. They have been telling the world that the NCPO want to return democracy. So then we shouldn't be considered as a threat. Instead, we should be considered as a kind of main contributing actor towards the process. But this is a thing that because of perception that they make a they kind of relate this to a kind of all kind of scenario that they think that might have happened, like student uprising or student protest. Because after the student protest in Konkan, that was the main concern for the NCPO when we were first invited, and they said they was they were quite concerned if student in Obon would also do the same thing. But then I said, that shouldn't be the case, but then it shouldn't be the main concern about student activity. If they let them go, then it, it will just go away. But the reason that we have been hearing about the Daoian groups again and again, just because of the arrest on that day, I, I personally think that if the Daoian group were not arrested, then the story would just disappear from the news within a week. Um. Just a short correction of the earlier answer I, 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 I answered. It was actually wrong because I was not a Thomasat University student before. So basically, I was not grown up with this kind of freedom of every inch um, ideology. So um, actually, freedom of every inch idea was mentioned by Sanya Thomasak, not Pridi Phnom Yong, in 1973. So that was actually after uh, October 14 event. So that happened actually after the idea of academic freedom. Free D didn't say anything about any freedoms, academic freedoms that time. Yeah. Just to clarify it. Next question, please. I'm, I'm Pano Wong Shum from China News Asia. Um, two questions. First is, um, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, student protests in recent weeks. And uh, how much freedom do you guys have compared to the students? Uh, and secondly, uh, you guys teach political science. Uh, how much? young people these days, the young Thai students uh, from your faculty and other faculty, how much interested they are in politics, generally speaking? I mean, we're on a military coup right now, but how much other students actually care? Okay, so you can, all three of you could answer that. Um, students have an effect of student protests mm -hmm. and how much they can do that and how much they care about politics. Okay. What was the first question again? I didn't really catch that. Sorry. Can repeat your you first one. How, you know, like... How much freedom do you guys have compared to your students? I mean, you've seen a lot of the student activists in recent weeks, but you know, academics are they as free as the students to express their political views about you know the current situation? Are you as free as the mm. students? Yeah. I, I think um, personally, I don't know if my analysis would be like the same as other professors. Um, for me personally, I think the students have more freedom to express themselves. We have higher cost for expressing our our ideas and our beliefs. Um, first, I think because um, of historical you know, development, students usually have special or privileged roles in you know, ex expressing their views, um, involving in this political activism, um, whereas the academia has not really have um, that role of you know, mobilizing people or like trying to you know, engage in protest. So in that case, historical development actually says that student has sort of better protection and privilege, um, you know, sort of uh, position to express their opinion. So I don't, the only thing for scholars or for academia that can do right now because it's too high cost for us, I, it's very selfish to say this, um, it's too, the cost is too high for us to actually engage in you know, activism. So the only way for us to do is keep speaking up for what we actually believe. But it's, it's actually 
could be like other types than you know participating in protest. So yes, student has more freedom, I guess. And secondly, in general, how students actually are interested in politics. I think because I'm teaching political science, I think they are generally very uh, interested in in politics. Doesn't mean that all of them, you know, believe in the same thing, but they can. It's a good thing. It's a good environment. It's a good thing about being in political science because you can engage in dialogue. Something that you cannot do in probably in real life because people tend to be too polarized. But you can have political dialogue even though you have different stances in the faculty of political science. And um, some of them that have pretty strong uh, stance against the coup or military government, uh, the way to express. They they basically just joke about it, yeah. Uh, in my opinion, in my experience, there are three ty three uh, types of student. From what I experienced uh, for ten years of teaching, the first type is the type that they just fed up with politics. They just you know indifference of whoever. The leader of the country will be whether a politician or a military leader. The second type is the mediocre or the medium student who, who somewhat interest and try to express their opinion, but doesn't want to be put in either red or yellow side. Uh, the third and the smallest uh, portion of my student are the one who's quite active in uh, political opinions. And I agree with Chan Bong Kwan that um, university student in this country has some sort of uh, more immunity protection in terms of uh, opposing the, 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 the junta. Because yeah, I, I cannot say any more. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can I ask I think in the way they have more freedom than us or than lecturers, but. In some cases, I don't think they do because you know university is not there to protect us students and university lecturers because like many president of university now it's like made it really clear that we have to actually follow the rules and instructions of the NCPO. And if I give you an example of um, my students, like uh, when we talk about the freedoms of expression. And uh, last month, the Prime Minister visited Ubon Rajatani University. And we were not aware of this. I didn't even know that the Prime Minister was going to Ubon. And then I got a phone call from the military asking if there were going to be any kind of student uh, demonstration or protest. And like my student didn't know about the trip. And then, but the military tried to ensure that there wouldn't be any kind of demonstration or protest by student by sending a message through the president, through the vice president of the university to make sure that students are not doing anything. I'm not saying this to support the student protest, but then I'm just telling you that this is the case that university is there to suppress student, not to encourage, to, to support the freedom, freedom of expression. And if you look at the cases of freedom of expression, I agree with Ajahn Bonghuan, what she mentioned about academic freedom. It shouldn't be um, classified as something different or exclusive to academic. It should be a kind of freedom that we, everyone has the same freedom. So this is the freedom that we are talking about. It's not just purely for those who are working in the university to have this. And so this is the thing that... Thank you very much. Robert. I'm not sure I should ask this question, but I, I will. Um, Good. I want the questions asked. This. The um, second speaker, I'm sorry, Ajahn, I, I, I'm very bad with names. Um, you, you said something to me that really interested me, and it's been sort of echoed here tonight. This crossing the line. Uh, straight question. Would you accept that no society will progress until someone is prepared to cross that line or the Rubicon? And until that happens, then the cycle will just continue. D That's did you have question. a line in mind? 
Mm, well, it's probably not the line that you might, might think. I, I, I guess what I'm saying is that the line is, no, I will not be silenced. I remember, I'm, I'm a child of the 60s, and um, I remember occupying the Chancellor's office at Macquarie University in Sydney because we were all anti the Vietnam War for personal reasons, you know, I didn't want to go there. And we went out now hundreds of thousands in the streets. Did it work? Yep, it sure did. We got a new government and the whole thing was scrapped. And my point is that someone, surely, I've been in Thailand a long time, and I'm waiting to see, it's not my fight, you know, I'm, I'm Australian, I'm not Thai. It's not my fight. But I'm waiting for someone to stand up and say, enough is enough, you know? Enough is enough. That's my question. Crossing the line. The can, there, can there be a real change if the students aren't willing to take a stand and, and test the limits? <laughs> no one wants to answer that, I understand. <laughs> I, I think uh, each people's life is different. And the fact that Mr. Mr. Jonathan had asked me twice that uh, why are you still in this country? That's pretty much uh, an answer to your questions that I'm still trying to go over the line but still be in this country. This is my country. This is the only country that I have the citizenship. Uh, this is a country that my wife is and my three children are born and I think we are part of this country. Uh, it might not be today, it might not be tomorrow, but you see people will eventually be free. Thank you. I hope so. Uh, perhaps as a follow-up, because I mean, we, I, I always feel at these events there's, a, as we say, an elephant in the room, a famous phrase, um, without crossing any lines. Uh, we're all bound by the law of 112, but it seems absurd that you all work in political science departments. Surely at some time, do any of your students ever say, well, we want to discuss the monarchy, or do they all know the line? Do they all stick with it? Or do you sometimes, as professors, have to intervene and say, I'm sorry, we can't talk about that? Um, I, I haven't been asked openly, but then, like I said, we... We are fully aware of of the the ceiling or the line that we can talk, and like it's make it difficult because you know like by having this kind of limitation because it make it more difficult for teaching because I'm teaching UK politics as well, and so even talking about the British system sometimes it's difficult because it's always about the interpretation of the law that make people scared and so then even I talk about the case of England and I still have to be very careful because people could interpret it in the wrong way as well. So this is so a you can't talk about the British monarchy? Um, I'm not comfortable talking about that in public as well it, with my students because you know if you look at the this kind of issues is more like a kind of interpretation. So I would try to avoid that. So this is a kind of the main obstacle for Thai education because we are not free to talk about, to compare different system. I think this is, a, is this very important if you want to actually make a progress in promoting democracy and human rights. We should be able to learn and freely discuss about different cases in different countries because no system is perfect. I'm not trying to say that the business system is perfect, but it can be a case for that we can look at and then this is a thing that I think uh, why academic freedom is very important for, for my teaching. Thank you. Um, in my classes, I uh, luckily don't have to, to t talk much about Thai politics. I'm mm. usually teaching uh, foreign policies, yeah. international relations, so not much about Thai politics, but also definitely there are some cases that are re relevant to, to talking about something that we cannot talk into public, but um, if the student asks, I would actually try to further the discussion with um, academic evidences, like something that have already published mm. and have, li have been widely discussed, uh, I have to do that because 
Otherwise, it can go along the line that is not supported by the evidences. Having an open discussion about something that, has, that is actually academically proven is probably better than having some other discussions. Thank you. Can we make this the last question, please? Yeah. Could you introduce yourself too, please? Uh, I'm uh, Andrew Silver, a retired un-American. Uh, like uh, John Akachai, I've had two pints. Uh, I hope I'm reasonably coherent. Uh, uh, there is, when uh, the junta uh, responds to the criticisms by the American and British ambassadors about the lack of freedom of democracy, the first line of defense seems to be that it is not the Thai way. That, uh, you know, Thainess, you know, requires something different from an imported system in the democracy, freedom supposedly are uh, foreign products. Uh, I, I don't really get this. Uh, does this simply mean uh, that uh, the Thai way is uh, antithetical to freedom and democracy? Or is there anything positive in what they are referring to as the Thai way? So the Thai way, can you see positive things in it as well when they insist that there is a Thai way that is not bound by human rights and democracy values. Well, to clarify the fact, I'm, I'm not a political scientist. I'm teaching uh, at Faculty of Law. I'm a law lecturer. Uh, there's, no, there's no Thai way democracy. That's a proven fact. Uh, Thai did not invent democracy. <coughs> we did not invent democracy. We, uh, the democracy came from the West. and. I remember clearly uh, two, two years ago, a uh, professor named Stephen Stedman from Stanford Center, uh, the gentleman was there in, in the event. Uh, there's a person asking about why we should have the same, same one person, one vote, and that's the uh, political, political equality. Uh, my, I always say this, my, my mother, she's, she's not even graduate from high school. She got married to my, my dad, and I could not go and tell her that, Mom, since now I'm a, a graduate of master's a program, I should have more work than you. So why? <laughs> at, the, at the time that she raised me uh, until now, uh, that's, uh, I cannot do that. Thank you. Tynus, is it? Uh, talking about Thai-ness or being Thai, I, I personally think that we are not different, Thai, Western, uh, British, American. So I don't quite believe in the, a kind of Thai-ness or being Thai that is different. Because actually I can give you an example because before I went to England when I, to, to do my master and PhD, we were told by teacher that, you know, Westerners are different. They are not close to each other. The societal structure is quite different, not like Thailand. You know, parents and sons are close to each other. And then. But then when my first year in England, I was living on campus. Parents went to drop off their children and took their children back to back home, you know, at the end of the term. It's not much different from what I have seen on the campus of Thai University. I, I went to Chiang Mai University. It's just kind of the same thing. Family bonds are still there in the West and in Thailand. Of course, there are different levels. But then, I don't think Thailand is different. So when we talk about Thailand, then we should also look at the concept of human rights as well, because human rights is not something that is alienated from being Thai, because being Thai is being human being, I human being, just like being Westerner, being American, being British, everyone is human being. So then we all should be protected by this. But the problem in Thailand, because we haven't been openly discussed or talked much about the concept of human rights, we talk about the, you know, the Thai culture, you know. Like I always say to my students that because now we talk about respecting Puyai, the kind of older generations, and then um, I always tell my, ask 
this question to my student, which one is more important, respecting Puyai or those who are older than you, or respecting the person as human being, or taking human rights as a kind of um, the uh, ceiling to, to talk about? And it's good that this day more student tend to answer that perhaps respecting human rights is more important. So we have seen a good trend in Thai society. I still believe that um, there is no such thing as Thainess, I would say. Um, I, I, I just actually spent like half an hour trying to explain this to my American friend yesterday um, about Thainess. And um, I think there is a thing called Thainess that caused me frustration, but I don't really know what it is. I think it's a, it's a, a, a problem, a, a common problem for, for, for people in my generation and probably younger generations because different generations are raised up differently. And um, we, I think we have so much frustration trying to really understand Thainess and what it really is. So I would say there is a thing called Thainess but I do not really know what it is. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. On that enigmatic note, we'll all search for the elixir of Tynus. Thank you very much to our three contributors. <laughs> <laughs>